I use the concept of micro goals. Um, I set micro goals every day, things that I can start building. So I build a winning streak and winning streaks build confidence. And one win builds into another win, which builds into another win. And then all of a sudden you feel like all you do is win. And so then you have all this confidence. Um, and they're micro goals, they're simple things. It could literally be like as simple if you're launching a product and you need to make sales calls, I'm gonna make 10 calls today. Tomorrow I'm gonna make 11 calls. I didn't say you're gonna close anyone and I didn't say you're gonna set any appointments. You're gonna make 10 calls today. When you make those 10 calls, okay, I just made 10 calls. Yeah, they were all no's and I got hung up on all 10 of them. Cool, made 10 calls today. Today, check on my little list. I'm a winner today. I, I succeeded in my goal for the day. I'm Mark Drager. And as an entrepreneur and strategist, I've built a multi-million dollar marketing agency. I've helped launch startups and transformed international brands. And yet, despite all the success, I still wake up every morning with the feeling that I'm just not good enough. And I've not come close to hitting my potential. And I may never achieve the high hopes that I have for myself. I believe that we all have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, to the voices in our own heads. And so each week, I share real, tactical advice and the most interesting and inspiring interviews because my goal is to help those of us who have something to prove show the world and ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. Welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast. Today's guest is a prolific serial entrepreneur. Now, I I don't have another way to say that, but even that doesn't do justice to his accomplishments in a really short amount of time. Over the past decade plus, he's launched and sold a breakneck number of startups within technology and business services, marketing, health, and now a retail food chain with 25 locations. Our guest went to law school to become a sports agent, but at the advice of his personal mentor, David Meltzer, was encouraged to start his first company during the Great Recession. Since then, he's become a startup and business scaling expert, and his current ventures, Everbowl and Super Fuel Coffee, are taking the market by storm. And while it's easy to shrug off these kind of accomplishments to personality or to luck uh, or well-connected friends, that's not the case at all. Our guests learn the hard lessons the hard way. He faced failed ideas and business launches, and he even came to learn that his real secret to success was through the relationship capital he built up with his peers and his business community. Get ready for the conversation that actually changed how I look at business myself. Please welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast, entrepreneur and very cool guy, Jeff Fenster. The, the, the first thing that I wanted to ask is you appear on paper to be obsessed with moving from organization to organization to organization, starting company after company after company. Um, do you have a bit of a problem? Is it an addiction at this point or are you just riding like a huge wave of success? <laughs> well, that's, I mean, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, I think it's, it's a combination of understanding what I love to do versus what, and what I'm good at versus what society sees as jumping from company to company. Um, I love startups. I love the idea of taking an idea or concept and figuring out how to bring it to market, how how to build it, how to start from zero and get it there. So yes, it seems like I jump from organization to organization to organization. And you know, that's why I come, I like to now call myself a serial entrepreneur versus just a a crazy ADD uh, guy who, who jumps from business to business and can't, can't stick to doing any one thing. But Realistically, no, what it, it is all built on serving my main business, right? So like, yes, I, I mean, I've jumped from industry to industry to industry, and now I, I love doing that. And I like to do it for three to five years and then do something else. Um, with my latest venture, though, I've created an ecosystem that's allowed me to build many startups inside. Mm-hmm. And I'm using a concept called vertical integration of multiple startups to solve my business problems. So it satisfies my desire to jump from, from new thing to new thing to new thing. But at the same time, it's letting me build something bigger than I've historically built things. Um, The seed from which vertical integration started was actually from the payroll and recruiting side where I realized I solved many problems by starting a recruiting agency. I was solving a sales problem in a rough time because I was organically growing my business by helping my current customers get more employees. I was building another line of revenue by doing that. And I was feeding my uh, and solving my own need to want to get back to the beginning of starting something else versus optimization, which at that point, my payroll company was at optimization level. You know, when, when you're a, when you're an eight figure company, it's more optimizing. It's not, 
it's not the zero figures, one figure, two figure, three figure, four. Like that's the fun part for me and getting those first sales and building those relationships and seeing those massive wins. Then when it's just repeat, rinse, repeat and optimize and make minor tweaks, I'm no longer the most qualified individual. Um, I have a very good understanding of my strengths and weaknesses and I just know I'm not the right guy. Um, and so, and I didn't know that then, but I know that now. So I'd rather put someone else in place or sell the company um, so the company can continue to grow and thrive and I don't hold it back. And I think that's a great point. In my, in my experience, you've hit on something, which is, you know, we all have superpowers and we're all going to be, especially when it comes to business, be able to apply at, to the right size company in the right stage of growth or optimization or even contraction um, if you're looking to do a turnaround. Um, but, you know, finding the right person for the right moment with the right type of company do you think that people tend to overlook how important that really is? Absolutely. And I think it, it goes to ignorance and ego most of the time. Um, Cause I was guilty of both of them. You just don't ignorance, meaning you just don't realize that there's different purposes at different times to have the right people running different things. Right. And then ego, because as a founder and a CEO of a company and it being yours, you want to believe that you can take it from zero to NASDAQ or whatever that, prize is at the end for you big sale or the next Facebook and you want to be Zuckerberg the entire duration it's just very rare um, and the best analogy I use and I'm a sports guy is when you look at sports you know and, and you look at a baseball team and you have a starting pitcher and then you have middle relief and then you have long relief and then you have spot relief and then you have closers right um, and there's a reason for that because the way the way my brain works is I want to I want to create I want to I want to try new things I want to take some calculated risks. Um, I want to venture where we haven't ventured. I'm a visionary. When you're trying to optimize a company, you don't need visionaries. What you need is to actually look at data, take the data, assess the data, assess the marketplace and find incremental wins that, that actually add big, big value into the P and L and reduce costs and figure out ways that you can continue to thrive and optimize the company without taking too much risk. It's also a different level of sophistication that I'm just not the most qualified. It's not my passion. So I'm not the right guy. So if I'm sitting there holding us back, then my ego is not letting the company grow. And if you're a sole prop, sole shareholder of your company, you can do what you want. But, you know, I'm, I raise capital. So I, I tend to have investors behind me. And, and my true job as a CEO is I work for them. You know, my job is to increase shareholder value every single day that I come to work and raise the enterprise value of the company. If I'm no longer the right person, and as the largest shareholder, I understand that, why would I wanna hold us back? Mm -hmm. So at that point, it's where it's like, okay, let's bring, like at our payroll company, we brought in a CEO at that point. Um, it was hard for me e on my ego because I was, I was young, I was 26 or 27 at this point, and, and I was very immature in the sense of, this was my, my real first go run at doing this whole thing, and I was like, well, why can't I be that guy? But the truth is, I wasn't. And it was the best. And it, at the time, it was, didn't feel like it, but it was the best decision we made. And I learned so much about who I am. And now I get to excel doing what I do, right? And when people can self-evaluate or self-analyze themselves and better understand who they are and where their strengths are, they might realize, you know what? I'm not a startup entrepreneur. I want to be an entrepreneur. And I keep starting companies and I fail because I'm not good at that zero to something range. I need to come in at a point when a company may have already gained market, uh, market, uh, some traction and some market penetration, and they might already be proof of concept and they might already have systems in place. And they might even be, maybe not the industry leader, but they might already be on, on the list. And they're the person who would come in and help drive the company further. Mm -hmm. They might look for opportunities like that, um, versus this over encompassing word entrepreneur, which to me is like saying, well, I'm a doctor. Well, what kind of doctor are you? Because if you're not, focused on what kind of entrepreneur you are just like saying you're a doctor you don't go to a podiatrist to get your brain worked on and you don't go to a brain surgeon when you break your arm they're specialists right and we as humans most people are not everything i so when you i i think i think you've lived with this point for so long that it's like it makes common sense black and white <laughs> makes total sense i th i think that for most entrepreneurs or people who are aspiring to be entrepreneurs that's mind-blowing to think that you might be the person to take a company from 4 million to 10 million, because I've been an entrepreneur for a very long time. I started my company in 2006. I was 23. Yep. Uh, 
that to me is a CEO. And I'm like, I'm not a CEO. I'm an entrepreneur. So it's my concept. It's my idea. It's my job to figure out operations and scale it and pay and all of those things. I would never think to step into someone else's vision. Um, even, even if I was best suited for that. And maybe even I am. <laughs> but you, but you are right. That's the, the beauty is you are uh, a startup entrepreneur. You are that person. I'm not saying you can't be, I'm just saying a lot of people, because I mean, I started the same time as you did 2007. Um, you know, when we started our companies for the first time and I was 24, you were 23 entrepreneurship wasn't sexy. It wasn't like this big buzzword, like it is today. We didn't have social media glorifying the seat, the founder and, I didn't and all use that. the word entrepreneur until 2011. I just said Correct. that I we was were business, business owners. Owner. We're business, we were owners. business exactly. owners. That's what we were. <laughs> And, and, and it's a different world now. Now entrepreneurship has this sexy connotation. I mean, I'm a, I'm a mentor at San Diego State's Lavin School of Entrepreneurship. Like they have their own school inside of colleges now where that's the focus. It was like, there was, there was no entrepreneurship classes when I was at the University of Arizona in, in the early 2000s. It was business degree and you can go to accounting or finance, but the word entrepreneurship just didn't exist. So we've over we've 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 created this sexy connotation around it which is amazing and we brought all this light to it and it's inspiring for people who feel like they're stuck in a job they don't like to go and start their own company and i think that's great and i and i promote and push anyone who has the vision and desire to go create their own financial freedom and start their own thing to do it i just challenge them to understand who they are and if they're not the right person surround themselves with the right people or join an early startup as a number two, a number three, a number four, a number five, because you can still be an entrepreneur, even if you don't start the company. My COO at Everbull, for example, or my CFO at Everbull, or my, my CDO at Everbull, they're all entrepreneurs. They're building processes from scratch inside of our ecosystem. There's no, there's no plan for them. I don't put a plan on their desk and say, this is how you're going to implement or run this division. I say, this is your division. Create everything you need to, every process, every system, every uh, every structure, all of the rules we're going to follow, you get to create it all. You're the entrepreneurial CFO, just like you would be a, an entrepreneur, but you don't have to do all the capital raising, be the face of the brand, you know, sales, uh, lease negotiations, contract, like all of that stuff they don't have to do because that's what I do. So we're teaming up with entrepreneurs together to form a company. Yes, I'm the founder, but they're entrepreneurs too. And so people listening or people who are sitting there saying, I want to do my own thing. I don't have the right idea, so I feel trapped. Join a startup. You get the freedom to be an entrepreneur, even if you're not just the founder. And that's what I'm hoping to elaborate more on when I go through that doctor analogy, just because I think it's great that it's sexy, but it's dangerous if people are taking risk and not, you can't be who you're not, right? So you don't hire me to come to Apple today and, and take over and take Apple from 1 trillion to 2 trillion. I'm not that guy. I'm, gonna, I'm just not going to do it. I love it. I love it. Now, uh, in, in you've, you've been described as um, using insight. So, you know, you do research, you, you do a lot of research, you, you leverage a piece of insight, you find that thing where you're like, this is, this is the next gap in the market. This is the next service. This is the next need, whatever that might be. Uh, I'm sure that it's, it's not that simple. But the question I have for you is, how do you not get lost in the research? How do you not find yourself... Um, not necessarily over researching, but how do you not get lost in the research? How do you know it's the right opportunity? What is it that that sits inside of you? The feeling, the moment, what happens where you go, this is the thing that I actually want to put time, resources, dedicate the next three to five years to raise capital, put my name on the line for, or like, how do you not just find yourself stuck before you take action? Well, um, first I, I had the benefit of having a law degree. So I spent three years in law school reading case law and as a, and what they teach you there is an analytical thinking approach and how to avoid red herrings, which is the things that people get caught up in, which is analysis paralysis and all spotting what the case, what the real issue is quickly. So I have some training doing that, which i now get to apply to business, which is amazing. Um, but secondarily, I don't do research in the traditional way. I don't, I don't do your traditional SWOT analysis and I don't, I don't go to Google and just, I don't, I just don't do all that stuff. Um, that's book. That's classwork. That's, that's there, there's a science and an art to this. Um, and I'm more of a field guy. So because I come into new industries with zero experience, I use that to my advantage. So I'm a customer first of the industry. That's what I am. So because I'm a customer, 
I, I already see the problem, right? Like you as customers and whatever you tend to shop at, if you go to your favorite blank or you go to, you know, Hey, I'm a snowboarder and I wish we had blank in the snowboard industry, or I'm a, I'm a parasailer or I, or I love books and, and, and I wish I had an electronic book because this hard copy books aren't working. And so Kindle was created like all the ideas or I, I love to travel, but I hate dealing with Expedia's and I want to deal with um, Airbnb, right? Oh, I hate taxi cab drivers and I hate that whole Uber. Like all those businesses were created because somebody understood the use case. So put yourself as the customer of your product or service if it's a customer focused thing, obviously if it's too technical and you're um, creating something else like rocket ships that go to space, different, but the stuff that, that I'm more likely to be involved in um, is more of the garden variety things. And then I look to improve it three to 5%. Um, everyone can, you know, a lot of people I talk to want to reinvent the whole industry. And it's like, three you don't to need 5%, to do that. Sorry, three to 5%, that's not three to five times better. You're not looking for, to try and nope. create something that's five times better. It's, it's not only cheaper, it's better built with better colors, with better style and better, better, better <laughs> nope. like all of that stuff. Nope. I want three to 5% because you can make millions of dollars with three to 5% and you can find them all over the place. Um, literally all over the place. Take my coffee line. So we have super fuel coffee the world's first acai infused coffee. I drink a lot of coffee and I sell acai. I put them together and I created acai infused coffee. The infused coffee space is, was already there. Coffee's already there. Acai's already there. So I'm just putting them together and trying to make coffee 3% better because now you get antioxidants with your cup. I get to introduce health that you, you're, you're drinking more healthy coffee, super fuel coffee, right? It's not like I went and created a whole new skew of product that didn't exist and created a, a, a brand new uh, drink. No, it's coffee with acai. So it's superfood infused coffee. That's a three to 5% marginal improvement, but I can make a lot of money doing that, right? And I, I don't have as much risk because the market's already there because you already have customers. The infrastructure around that idea is already there. The players are already there. The space is there. So now I get to come in and just take best in breed of what I like and don't like and put it together. Same thing with my restaurant space. You know, I opened Everbowl. Um, acai bowls weren't very popular, but smoothies were. And I knew the natural transition for smoothies and juice was going to be bowls uh, because I'm, I'm a consumer of it. I was eating them in my house. You know, back in 2016, there wasn't really bowl centric places. Jamba Juice had one on the menu, but it was very small. Nectar didn't even sell them. And it was mostly about juices and smoothies. But everyone who had one of these bowls was like, man, these are really good. And then it was like, okay, now look at what Chipotle did with Mexican food. That was a 3 to 5% improvement. They didn't in introduce a new product. They introduced a new system that was stolen actually from, you know, the pickup sticks and the Jersey mics and the subways and, apply and Blaze Pizza and applied it to Mexican food and it worked, right? This, I want to build my own bowl and go through the assembly line and on demand in front of me ordering. So I did the same thing for acai bowls and now I have 30 restaurants. And, and again, it's, it's marginal improvements. I'm not trying to reinvent anything. I'm just trying to take the pieces that everyone's that are there that just because everyone else is lost in the forest for the trees, cause they all have experience. I'm just seeing as individual pillars that I don't know how the puzzle is supposed to go. So I get to apply 2016 or now 2020 mindset with 2020 applications and 2020 thinking to the problem. And that allows you to be very dis disruptive and enter these markets very quickly. But how do you know the thing is the thing? I mean, you must just see opportunity everywhere. So, mm -hmm. so how do you know that thing is the thing and not the other yeah. 15 areas you could pursue? I mean, you, you never know. Obviously, I've, I've had a lot of companies that have not worked out as well as I wanted them to. Um, and I've had a lot of companies that worked out better than I could have ever imagined. Um, it's just a question of what do you see? See, I, I ask myself, what do I see myself doing for the next 18 to 24 months? And it was like, okay, I'm going to do Everbowl. Well, I had another company. The, the truth is when I launched Everbowl, I was actually meeting with my designer about another company, a completely different product, completely out of the health and wellness space. And my original plan was to launch that company in the back of Everbowl. I was going to open my first Everbowl, have, have, do the sales, and then put an office in the back and launch this other company that I thought was going to be the bigger company from the back. Um, and when I opened Everbull, I got so busy so quickly, I never had time to focus on the other business. So Everbull became the thing. So it wasn't really like I knew this was going to be the thing without question. That's just not how it happened. 
I was going to simultaneously run, you know, these two different companies um, and, and do them both. And I just, I still haven't launched the other company. It's still on the shelf waiting. Names done, designs done, logos done. I mean, everything's ready. It's just sitting there waiting for when I'm done. But Everbull just took off. Like things just happened so quickly. So obviously, like a flag in the wind, you go, you go in the direction of the wind. You have the momentum behind you. You obviously have hit something that the market likes. Now you put all your focus on it. If the market was like tepid and it was like, okay, it's doing okay. I'd have a manager there and I'd be in the back working on my other company. Today we'd be talking about that company instead of Everbull. Um, but I would have monetized my office by Everbull, which is what I was trying to do. So you, you seem like the type of guy who doesn't tie your, um, your, your confidence or your um, personality or your ego or anything to winning or losing. Like you mentioned, you've had companies that didn't succeed and you've had companies that succeed. You string them all together and you're going to come out with a pretty good average. Um, but as you continue to go from opportunity to opportunity, to opportunity, do you not find that for yourself, there's a higher pressure from shareholders, from people you're grabbing money from and from yourself to not have the next one be a loss? Well, I look at it more as the game of the long game. So I don't isolate that thinking to one entity. People who invest with me, and I tell this to anyone when I meet with an investor, if you're betting on the idea that I have in front of you, don't invest. You're betting on me. You bet the jockey, not the horse. Anyone who's an investor should know this. If you're going to bet back an entrepreneur, you bet on the person not the idea because anyone who gives me a plan, like when I look to and make investments now and I meet with entrepreneurs and they give me their business plan, that's cool. That's great. That's their intention. Right, Tomorrow eight, it's going to be months completely later, different. It's gone, right? <laughs> it's, it, it, if they're still running that plan, we failed, right? It, you better adapt, right? You can say, oh, I'm going to do this tomorrow and then the world's going to happen and you're going to have to figure it out, right? COVID happened and we completely pivoted our entire company six months ago. Um, if I was just living on this rigid business plan, then that's that. So, so people who invest with me understand that they, they are hopefully betting on, on, on what I'm telling them I'm going to do. But more importantly, they're betting the fact that I'm going to find a way to make sure that I monetize their investment and get them a, a return. So if the company's not successful, we should be doing something else. Like I'm, I don't like the idea of just like straight failure. It, it, it's very hard to straight fail if you're living with a Kaizen attitude and a change ready mentality. And I, and those are some of my core values. So um, we're always looking to get 1% better and we're always ready to change. We're always ready to adapt. So whatever we thought we were going to do today may not happen, um, but we're going to consistently and, and persistent, be consistent and persistent in our pursuit of success, whatever that is. And so, yeah, there's pressure, obviously. I mean, I have investors and you know, I never want to lose the, the number one key as an entrepreneur. If you want to raise capital, never lose investors money. Um, as long as you return them money, you always have investors and people will give you a check again and again and again. And you can make someone money 10 straight times. And if you lose money for them on the 11th, they will not give you a check on the 12th. So it is very important that if you take someone's capital, that you get them a return. But they understand that number one, I put more of my money in than I then and, and I self fund these things to start. So I'm all in. And um, I, I don't wear the pressure in that sense. Like I'm doing the best I can and I give a hundred percent of myself and anyone who's around me knows that. And I surround myself with incredible people that are going to do the same thing. And that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring a team. And if we're not successful, I honestly believe that, that investors and, and everyone will, uh, understand. And then I'm going to bring them in on the next deal on my own dime and make it up to them because I want to make sure that their capital is returned to them. That's what I wanted to ask you. So I think a lot of times for people like me, you know, I have, I have anxiety and worry. I've been in business a long time, but I, I don't like failure. Unfortunately, <laughs> I don't like right. failing. I don't like being the guy to fail, but when you make a mistake, uh, it's, it's usually a huge uh, punch in the gut, slap in the face. You know, it's just like plainly obvious and you can learn from it and that's great. But then our next job is to, to own it and to make it right. And so I was going to ask you, you know, like if you're facing, um, uh, if I think most people don't start these ventures and carry these ventures and scale these ventures because they hit their comfort level ceiling and they don't want to go to the next level and fail. But you can go there and there is an acceptance that it fails, but it's your job to make it right. So, so you were saying like you'll roll people into the next opportunity or mm -hmm. how do you, when you're facing, 
a venture's failure, you're putting it to bed. How do you make it right to the team, to the staff, to the customers, to your stakeholders? Well, for it's not that's a that's a very tough question because I don't have a ton of experience folding bigger enterprises that <laughs> at that point, uh, knock on wood, um, knock on wood for us all. Yeah. Usually, usually they fold much earlier and, and hopefully I haven't raised any capital at that point. Um, but okay, so, so let's, let's hit on that for a second. So, so you're self funding and getting to a part where you have proof of concept in market, um, your, your, you know, your past pre-revenue, let's say, and then you go to investors simply to scale. Yes. I never raise money pre-revenue. I think that's, that's, that I mean, unfortunately, um, I'm in a position in life I can self fund my own my own my own ventures. But I opened four Everbowls before four restaurants before I raised any money, and I raised that money to scale because raising money for growth is easy. Raising money to prove your idea out is very hard. You're taking all the risk. You're you're and you're asking or you're asking your shareholders to take all the risk because proof of concept hasn't happened. You haven't generated revenue. You have an idea. Cool. If uh, you think your idea is worth anything, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's just not, there's a billion ideas out there and 9,900 people have your same idea or some version of it. Like you do not have a, a truly unique idea until you actually create it. Once you've created it, then you have an idea. That's the difference. And I think people get caught up on, well, oh, I have this amazing idea and it's worth something. It's not worth anything. Um, People who invest in you are investing in you. And, and if you think they're investing in your idea, going back to what we just talked about, um, I'm going to save you a lot of uh, learning. They're not. They're investing in you. So the whole thing is I have ideas and I have lots of ideas. And some of them are good and some of them suck. But we're going to figure out a way to make money. And so if you can, try not to raise money pre-funding or uh, pre-revenue because you're exposing yourself to, to a life of, losing investors money and having a lot of anxiety and then putting yourself behind the eight ball to where you can't scale these companies once you finally do hit some something that works because the investor community in, in most areas and i'm in san diego one of the top 10 largest cities in the country is still small all my investors know each other mm -hmm. right so if you don't behave in a certain way and you don't and, and all of a sudden the, the word gets out oh yeah i lost money on on jeff's deal uh he had this idea it never it never came to fruition well then I've lost all my audiences to scale businesses and I don't have unlimited capital, but you want to be able to scale companies. So, you know, like I'll use a company that I failed on. Uh, it was called equity circle. And the idea back in 2011 was to legalize equity based crowdfunding, very similar to like Kickstarter mm -hmm. and, and go fund me, but it was for equity because as an, as a, as an entrepreneur, I wanted to raise micro investments from a lot of people, but it was illegal until the jobs act of 2012. And so we spent a lot of money getting, change.org petitions signed, got hundreds of thousands of signatures. We we're going to build this amazing platform, sunk a lot of money into R&D. Jobs Act passed. Everything was great. But then we weren't ready with our application and our platform and all these other companies that were waiting for it to pass were ready to strike. So we lost, you know, we lost six figures and, and that's what happens. And you move on. Um, had I gone to my investors, investors with that idea, I think I would have raised money, no problem. And then I would have lost their money. And it was because I was focused too much on my idea and I wasn't adapting to the market and recognizing all this other stuff. I was leading the cause. I was, I was too engaged and too intimately involved in the cause. Um, and so I wasn't, I would have lost everyone money. Well, that would have sucked. And luckily I didn't, I lost my own money and I can lose my own money because that's whose money should lose. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the founder. So I should take all the, I hope, the, the, I hope that next time, risk. next time, if you find yourself speaking to, the uh, the heads of Indiegogo or Kickstarter, uh, you should yeah. you should get a thank you note for all of that effort that you put into it. <laughs> <laughs> well, luck, uh, yeah, right. Um, so it's just you know, again, it's just I think the the critical thing for me is and for entrepreneurs out there is to just not not worry about failure because failure is when you quit, right? So as long as you are not quitting, you're learning. It's sometimes you win and sometimes you learn and take those learnings and keep applying them. But you build an army around you. And, and make sure that you're committing to being change ready and adapt your ideas as, as the, as the market conditions demand okay. and dictate. So, so um, if, and I mean, you're, you're a very well-spoken person. You have a ton of experience. You've, you've learned a lot of things the hard way. Uh, you come across like you have a lot of confidence, which is, which is awesome. That's what you want when people are buying into you versus the idea. How do you, 
um, manage or handle the situation because it's, it, for most of us, it's very easy to have confidence in the things we've mastered. But doing the things that you've mastered won't get you to move forward. I mean, you're not going to grow if you just stay within your comfort zone of the things that you're very confident in. And so we're always bumping up against this trying to project confidence, but realize that we're a little bit out of our depth, right? You're moving from one industry to another or this or that. How do you um, build confidence for something that you have no right to have any confidence uh, for or around? Uh, so I, I use a concept of micro goals. Um, I set micro goals every day, things that I can start building. So I build a winning streak and winning streaks build confidence. And one win builds into another win, which builds into another win. And then all of a sudden you feel like all you do is win. And so then you have all this confidence. Um, and they're micro goals. They're simple things. It could literally be like as simple if you're launching a product and you need to make sales calls, I'm going to make 10 calls today. Tomorrow I'm going to make 11 calls. I didn't say you're going to close anyone. And I didn't say you're going to set any appointments. You're going to make 10 calls today. When you make those 10 calls, okay, I just made 10 calls. Yeah, they were all no's. And I got hung up on all 10 of them. Cool. Made 10 calls today. Today, check. On my little list, I'm a winner today. I, I succeeded in my goal for the day. Because you do that every day, and in 10 days, you're going to be making 20 calls. And, all, and guess what? And also, you've now made 10 plus 11 plus 12 plus 13 plus 14. You've made all these calls, which means your experience is getting better. Your talk track is getting better. You're hearing more objections. And by the time you get to 50 calls a day, you're going to start to be closing some deals. And hey, my goal is 50 calls today. Done that. And by the way, I set six appointments. Cool. Maybe tomorrow my goal is to set six appointments. So I'm going to make as many calls as I have to to make those six appointments because now I believe I can make those appointments versus just making the calls. And so it's just micro goals. And I build confidence through consistent effort every day of picking up these wins. So it's like, well, at this point, I did, I did it yesterday, so I can do it today again. Like it's, it's a skill. And so um, that's how I build confidence, especially in areas where, you know, um, that I have – no experience or, or that I may feel like I don't belong yet. Um, and then I also believe for me, I'm very confident because I've learned now over the last 15 years that a lot of winning is done by just effort, um, <laughs> hard work. Uh, a lot of people like to talk about working hard. A lot of people like to talk about, Hey, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. And my work ethic is great. And, and the truth is majority of people don't put forth the work ethic that comes necessary. So I can outwork most people and win, even if they're better than me. Uh, and that, knowing that means that I have a lot of confidence because I'm comfortable that if I walk into a, an arena of a vertical, a niche, a sector, an industry, I don't call it what you want, um, I'm going to outwork the majority of them that are more qualified than me. So I'm going to get myself up into the, into the success range may not be number one, but I ain't going to be number bottom. I'm going to be, I'm going to get myself there with just hard work. Um, and that's going to build me a, a, a viable business and I'm going to be viably successful. And from there, as my skills match my, my work ethic, I'll move myself higher up the ladder until eventually I'm aiming for the number one spot. Of course I'm competitive, but those are the two things that I do that allow me to be confident. Um, you know, when I'm doing something new, like right now I'm, I'm writing a book. And I'm actually writing two books. I've never written a book before. That's hard. And say. yeah, and I'm, I'm co-authoring a book with my mentor, Dave Meltzer, and I'm writing my own personal book on relationship capital. And I'm going to be a bestseller. And that's my goal. And I'm doing it. I'm not great at it. But every day I have a micro goal that I'm going to continue to move that forward. And I'm going to continue to get better at it. And I'm learning what I can simultaneously to doing what I'm doing because I want to get more of this message out there. I think that the, I have some insight that can help a lot of people. And I'm at a point in life where I want to help. You know, it's funny, you, you, it's, it's, it's amazing how in your, in my twenties, I didn't, I mean, I, I don't want to sound like I'm a jerk, but I didn't give a shit about helping anyone else. I just wanted to make a lot of money and be successful. Um, now that I have older kids and I'm getting almost, to, I'm, I'm staring 40 very soon. Um, <laughs> it's scary. It's a scary number, but you start to realize that no, like, I don't, I, now I'm not fulfilled anymore with just personal gains. Like I have more fulfillment being a mentor at, at San Diego State's Live and School of Entrepreneurship and watching these young kids go through the, pro, the process. And if I can help them better understand a successful process, the success formula that I know works, and I can help them learn that earlier and watch them get their wins. I'll be honest, one of the best calls I got in 2020 
was from my mentee when he made a big win in one of his one of his things that he was working on. I literally carried that high all day. And I remember laying in bed that night going, man, that was awesome. I had no financial interest in that. I had no personal brand in that. Like I got no credit. Like it was nothing for me. But watching him, almost like a child, watching him succeed in business in an area that that I'm very good at was amazing. So I want to give back. And so now I'm trying to do this. And obviously the the book space is very competitive and I'm not a writer and um, there's a lot of amazing writers and people that are much better at it than I am. So I'm just setting micro goals. Every day I'm writing a certain amount. I'm contributing a certain amount of time to it and I'm building these wins and I'm going to be a confident author at some point. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Can you talk to me a little bit about the idea of relationship capital? I mean, I I have, um, I, I know someone who's, who's a really, really strong strategist on the marketing side and they set their entire consultancy off of the idea that a brand has, uh, is a capital asset. Your brand yep. is a capital asset that has value that should be just as important on your books as anything else. I've, I've spoken to lots of people who, who pick up on these non-financial aspects of a company to say, this is, this is just as important as any kind of other you know, long-term capital asset that you have to invest in, culture, uh, cultivate, grow, and what have you. Um, it seems to be a bit of a pet project for those of us who have this extreme focus on one area of the business to try and convince the world that, that this is the thing. I'm not saying that that's your case, but when I hear relationship capital, I go, ooh, that's interesting. What is this and is this actually real? Yeah, so, so I do believe it is the most important currency an individual in business and life can have. Um, people don't realize that relationship currency is the same thing as physical currency. You use it to buy goods and you use it to, you, we buy and sell things with money and capitalists in capitalism, but we do the same thing in relationships. We make deposits and withdrawals with each other every day. And um, I'm going to, I'm going to do a little plug. It's, it, it's free for anyone listening. So I'm not making money on this, but I have a course, uh, LinkedIn learning hired me to do a course. It's live on LinkedIn learning. If you're a LinkedIn premium member, you can check my relationship capital course. Um, I have a couple, but that's the one on relationship capital. If you're not a LinkedIn premium member, hit me up and I'll send it to you for free so you don't have to pay. But it's, uh, it's about 36 minutes of micro little micro classes, two minutes long each. And I teach you how to build relationship capital, how to use it and how to leverage it to exponentially grow your companies and yourself. And that's my plug. Now to what is relationship capital? So um, relationship capital if you, if, and, and I'm going to use an, an uh, kind of an overarching thing we've all said a million times. Oh, so-and-so only got there because he's so-and-so's brother or sister. Or so-and-so's married to so-and-so. Or, oh my gosh, I got passed up at work by this person. They have no, I have so much more experience than them. I'm more qualified than them. But they're best friends with the, with the, with the hiring manager. Well, that's, you, just, you, just, you just articulated relationship capital. Who you know is more important than what you know. And it's more important than how you do it. So understanding that by making friends with more people and an understanding of how to make deposits with people, you can open so many doors and exponentially grow your company by buying time, access, and um, opportunity that you were never going to have otherwise. And I've used these so well throughout my career that it's allowed me to be successful at times when I probably shouldn't have been because I wasn't the most qualified. And I'll give you a quick example. My very first job, my only job out of, out of law school was at ADP, the payroll company. And um, I worked there for six months. So Just I, enough time to learn what you needed to do to start your own payroll company, right? Well, I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. I thought I was going to, I, was, I went to law school to be a sports agent and I had a job lined up at Lee Steinberg Sports Agency with David Meltzer. And um, I decided I didn't want to pursue that career. So when I graduated, I had law school loans and no idea what I was going to do. A friend of mine had a job, uh, worked at ADP. I was like, Jeff, you're great in sales. Come, come work at ADP. I was like, great, no problem. I'll come do that. So I figure out what's next. And I had this job selling payroll. So I went to Dave and I said, Hey Dave, so this is me using relationship capital. I went to my mentor, Dave, and I made a withdrawal. I said, Dave, I have a favor. I'm supposed to sell payroll. I just got this quota. I'm supposed to sell like 10 deals this month. I've never sold payroll before. They taught me how to do it, but um, I, would you mind making me some introductions to some of your friends that own businesses that have employees? And he's like, sure. So I came over to his house. We spent two hours. He drafted this email and he sent it to 500 friends, 400 <laughs> friends, some big ass number, <laughs> huge. Yeah. And I sent like 55 or 60 appointments from that mass email. And I closed like 90% of those. And I, and I ended up being the number one sales rep in the country. My first two months on quota, 
at ADP because a friend of mine opened his Rolodex and was able to say, my good friend, Jeff, he validated me to them is coming to talk to you about payroll. It would be awesome if you met with him. Then my making friends with them when I went there allowed me to close this business. So I instantly sold more business than all of my contemporaries across the entire country because I had a relationship with someone who had already built up enough relationship capital with all of these decision makers. That goes across so many levels. So then I took that lesson, that principle, and you keep applying it, right? So it's the idea of me and you. If, if I'm talking with you and I ask you for a favor, I'm making a withdrawal. If I'm interested, if I find out problems you're having or introduce you to someone who I think might help, or you want a special guest on your show that maybe I know, so I connect them. And I do all these things for you and I lead with value. I'm just making these deposits with you, right? I'm not asking for anything. I'm just doing you favors. I'm helping you. I'm understanding you. I'm asking questions. I'm intimately and emotionally getting invested in you, the person. I'm learning about what you like. Hey, maybe I know you like, uh, you like, a certain a certain musician and i know they're coming to town so i send you a little note hey i know your favorite band's going to be playing this thursday thought of you here's two tickets like i just do little things for you to help well all i'm doing is making deposits doesn't mean i'm going to ever use it but one day if i need something and i've made all these deposits with you you're going to be there for me right more importantly you're going to you're going to do it organically without me ever asking you're going to be like god that guy jeff he's a good dude man i know he's writing this book i know a friend who's a who's a publisher Hey, Jeff, I just wanted to introduce you to my friend, uh, Sally. She's a publisher over at this place. I don't know if it's going to help, but I just thought of you. I know you're writing a book. Sally, Jeff's a cool guy. You should meet him. Boom. Now, who knows? Maybe me and Sally hit it off. Maybe we don't. But we're leveraging the power of relationship capital. And we're growing that way. And this works across everything. By making friends with more people, you open your opportunity circle up. You're not segmented to your one vertical. And I'll use another example. My biggest payroll client, well, one of my biggest payroll clients I had with my own personal payroll company, I got from actually a lead, a referral from the woman who does the checkout at the grocery store. And I'd made friends with her for two and a half years, like just talking, like, you know, you're in the grocery line and you see small talk. How are you? How are your kids? Yada, yada, yada. Nothing came of it. I wasn't expecting anything from it. I was just genuinely making a friend and just having a, you know, three minute conversation twice a week but it got deeper than just paper thin. It got deeper to, oh, how's your day? Oh, cool. Thank you so much. I'll see you tomorrow. No, it was like, oh, how, how's your daughter's soccer team? Oh, you know, she'd ask me about my daughter's soccer team. And, oh, did you guys win? And, like, we got to that level to the point where one day she said, hey, my brother, you have a payroll company. My brother's looking for a new payroll company. Can I connect you? And I was like, yeah. He had almost 2,000 employees at that company. So it was a massive deal that I instantly got credibility, validation, and that opportunity because I made friends with somebody. That's the power of relationship capital. So, you know, I know like Carnegie has his book, Making Friends, uh, how, to, how to Win Friends and Influence People. Mm -hmm. um, that's the foundation of it. But re really, it's about walking through this world and understanding that everybody is somebody's brother, sister, cousin, aunt, uncle, mother, father. And we all know enough people that if you just build good quality relationships and you lead with value and you be more interested in them than interesting and you build this army, you have this currency that you can use professionally and personally to expon exponentially grow in ways that, that um, and I'm doing the quick version. The course will actually teach you how to do all this stuff of course, and how to course. use it. Now, now, let me ask. I uh, believe people, um, I don't know if over-index is the right word. I believe people think that the answer that everyone needs is the thing that worked for them but came naturally to them. So, sure. I've heard in your story, hey, you know, my friend came to me and said, you're great at sales. Well, you're probably great at sales because you're great at relationships and you're great at connecting and you're great at talking to people and it doesn't scare you or worry you and you don't have social anxiety or anything else. And so, and so you've stacked together something that works really well for you. Now, in your book, are you going to teach people who aren't great at this to become great at this? Or is this the next level for those who already have kind of a few natural talent, uh, uh, natural talents in this area and then they just need to systematize it and make it better? So I'm going to answer, I'm going to answer you, but I'm going to first lead and tell you, I'm actually shy. Okay. So um, if, if we went to a bar, I probably wouldn't feel comfortable and I wouldn't talk very much. And when, when I meet people socially, I'm not the most uh, outgoing life of the party. Like that's not who I am. Um, I understand how to make friends because I've honed these skills through again, micro goals. My, my, I challenge everyone, say hi to three people today that you normally wouldn't. 
when you're walking, just say, hi, hi, how are you? Boom, move on. Eventually someone, oh, I'm good, thank you, how are you? Oh, I'm good, now you're in a conversation, right? It's micro goals. I've, I've incrementally gotten better at these skills and I've learned how to be good in sales because I make friends, but I make friends because I'm more interested in them than interesting. And what I mean is I ask questions. I, it, it's the easiest thing. When you don't know what to do in, a, in these situations, ask questions. Oh, what are those trophies over your shoulder? You know, think big, be bold, say yes. Oh, that's, that's so cool. What does that mean to you? Where, where, did, where did you see that? Who's the author? Like I can ask questions. Oh my God, I love that shirt you're wearing. Where did you get it? That's a really cool hat. What does that mean? Like there's just little things that you can do to get the conversation going and get the other person to start talking. And from there, you'll start to, I mean, we're all, I mean, unless you're completely socially adept, uh, you know, inept, um, there are certain social cues that will happen and, and you'll get more comfortable talking with strangers and, and learning how to do these things. So yes, in the book, I will teach how to do these things with these micro goals. And I, and in the course too, I give specifics on like little things you can start today to do. And you're going to start to see an improvement in the relationships you make and these opportunities. And, and I get what you're saying. Yes, obviously it's worked for me. So I think it's the, it's the panacea of success. Um, no, but, and I'm with you. I, I understand totally. I'm just saying that for where, where I think I'm similar to a lot of the people who are listening or would listen um, and why I think they can gain value is, is I don't have, I'm not a rocket scientist. I'm not a computer programmer. So I'm not Bill Gates. I'm not Zuckerberg. I'm not Elon Musk. Um, I don't have any one skill that is off the charts and I stand atop everyone else. And so I'm leaning on that. No, I'm, I'm, I'm more of just, I'm good at a lot of things. I'm maybe great at a couple of things and I'm mediocre at a lot of things. And I don't really have this one thing that defines who I am professionally. So I've had to kind of figure out how to be a Swiss army knife and be successful in this world. And I think a lot of people feel in that same thing. It's like, you know what, I'm pretty good with numbers and, but I, you know, I'm not, I, I, I don't have a uh, goodwill hunting brain where I can just like know a math equation, like, you know, and I don't have, I, I don't have any of those skills. And I, I think a lot of people who are, who are good at lots of things, maybe not great and mediocre, at lots of things and are trying to figure it out. These tactics, these hacks work to help you be successful. If you're the next Mark Zuckerberg, you don't need to make friends with anybody. You can just go program the next Facebook and, and that's cool. Um, I'm not the person to help you. And I don't know how to do that because I don't have those skills. So it's, it's kind of like, this is for the every man and every woman, just the normal, normal walk person who has some attributes and it's figuring out how to use them and then use micro goals to get better at the areas that you're not. And to, again, it's like, it's like social media today. I'm talking to you today 2020 i'm not talking to you to in 2008 if we were having this conversation in 2008 i'm not a very polished version of myself mm -hmm. and hopefully in 2030 i'm a much more polished version of myself right because i'm getting better every day kaizen the idea of getting one percent better every single day that allows this to happen and, and too often people want to go 10 percent better today well you're not going to get 10 percent better today get one percent better today it's sustainable it's 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 it's, it's it's, a, it's obtainable and sustainable. It's something that you can actually do and you can do it on a daily basis and consistency is going to win, win the game. I love it. Uh, it's interesting. The other, the other day someone asked me, so I've gone through a bit of a health journey. I've never been healthy. I've never been fit. I've never cared about diet. You know, I've, I was able to lose 50 pounds over two years by- uh, Congratulations. Well, thank you. Uh, it, people look at it and they look at pictures before and after and go, wow. But what they don't realize is it's like actually eight weeks of extreme focus and then a month or two of being bad and then being good <laughs> and being bad. So it looks like this great journey, but it's like everything else in life. Uh, I say that though, because uh, uh, people ask me questions about it. And my answer to them is it's not about discipline. It's about sacrifice. So, so for me, I'm not actually that disciplined. I am all kind of all over the place, but I'm able to say, no, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to do that. Or I am going to do it. And the other thing is it's not even the things that you do. It's the things that you cut. It's the things that you stop doing that you hold yourself to stop doing. So I, I say all that to frame, I guess, this question, what were the biggest moments or breakthroughs that you can recall that you've had where it was the realization, I have to stop doing this to be able to see that breakthrough. I have to cut this. I have to, like, because we're growth focused. So it's more, 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 more. 
But often it's like, oh, I have to stop doing this. And then you stop and suddenly it now opens up. It, it opens up space. It opens up time. It opens up everything for whatever's next. Well, uh, the, the big one I could say was I had to lose the ego at, uh, through my profession. I'm assuming we're talking professionally. And, anything uh, in life. Anything in life. Well, professionally, I had to lose the ego. Uh, I had this bad habit. So the, through my first handful of companies, amazing people, we would hire them. They would join the team. And then eventually they would leave. And I kept saying, why are these people leaving? You know, why are they leaving? And eventually it was like, oh, well, maybe I should look at the person in the mirror because the one constant was me. And it was that I was, I believed ignorantly then that as the founder CEO, I had this insecurity that if I didn't get credit for everything, I'd be a fraud. That I couldn't, I couldn't give the credit to the amazing people that were on the team. Um, I had to somehow put my shoulders next to them and stand atop the, the, the podium. Um, and when I stopped doing that and I recognized that, no, I want to be the dumbest guy in the room and surround myself with smarter people and let them be great and give them the credit. Um, and then I'll just do the things that I'm good at. And that's cool. My companies grew exponentially. And obviously the byproduct was, yeah, sure. We all got credit and, and we were more successful and we now retain and attract amazing talent. Um, and so that was a major breakthrough because now, you know, like looking at the companies I'm working at now and doing now Everbull and, and we build, co uh, we build stuff and super fuel coffee and unevolved products. We're not anywhere, but for the amazing people that I have around me, because I don't know how to do a lot of the things we do. It's truly, I'm standing on the shoulders of incredible talent. And that's allowed me to exponentially grow much higher than I ever would have trying to do it all on my own. And so that was a big breakthrough professionally. Um, and then personally, you know, I think, I think it, it also kind of, I, I, I stopped trying so hard because the negative of trying to always make friends is you try too hard. Um, and I had this bad thing where I wanted everyone to like me, like everybody. And so it was tough because you're never going to get everyone to like you and you're never going to get everyone to understand you and you're never going to get everyone to agree on anything. I mean, we're living in a very polarizing time and not touching that elephant, but um, whatever side you're on, no one there, you can't get 10 people to agree on anything. And so it was very tough for me personally, because that's one of the reasons I was shy is I felt like, you know what, if I don't say much, then they won't not like me. They just, okay. You know, and I had to overcome that. And I started to do that by recognizing that, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do what I can to like the person I see in the mirror. And I'm going to do my best to help as many people as I can and be my best self. And what, you know, my mentor taught me uh, also that your success should, you shouldn't hide your success because it's going to make other people feel small. You should shine with your success so you can help show them that it's possible and obtainable and help them develop and, and get their own shine and their own success. And that was an interesting lesson for me to learn over the last four or five years, especially now in 2020, when we're dealing with, with COVID, you know, we're having a really good year, even though we shut down our restaurants, 30 of them in, in March, 28 of them in March. Um, and it looked like our business was going to go out of business. We pivoted and, and adapted and are now selling franchises and are now um, on QVC selling later bowls and doing all these amazing things. And our restaurants are open and generating more revenue. And I was a little uneasy at talking about it. And we're actually writing a book together, my mentor and me. And this was one of the chapters. And he challenged me to not not feel bad about it, that that I shouldn't feel guilty because I can't be broke enough to help a lot of people. I can't. Right. If I'm broke, I can't help anybody. I, I'm going to be focused on getting my own. But if I make a lot of money and I'm a giving person, I can now give back and help elevate more people. Right. So it's the idea of, of receive so you can give instead of give so you can receive. Um, and it's a weird concept and I'm still working towards that. Wasn't that something? OK, now you can see why that conversation literally changed how I even think about business myself. And I'm 14 years into my own company. So key takeaways for me, number one, focus all your efforts on what you're truly good at. Number two, investors are investing in you. They're not investing in your ideas. And number three, who you know, so much more important than what you know or how you go about it. I just wanna remind you that as always, you can rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts. It would mean a lot to me as a startup. That makes a huge difference. If you're not subscribed, be sure to subscribe. And if you want to connect with me, you can find me on IG. You can drop me a DM. Now remember, those of us who have something to prove can show the world and ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. But you have 
to think big. You must be bold. And you've got to go out there and you've got to say yes. Why? Because we do hard things. Thank you.